Alrighty, so we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the second week of our catalysis webinar. This week, I'm really uh, excited to introduce our speaker, speaker Dr. Charles Mahan. So first, let me introduce myself. I'm Lorianne Schultz, and we also have on here Corbin uh, Fight to today. We're both from the American Vacuum Society here at the University of Central Florida. And the way that this webinar is organized is Dr. Mahan will give a 30 to 45 minute topic lecture um, with research applications, and then we'll have a 10 minute question and answer time. So if you have any questions at any point during the lecture, feel free to just type your question in the chat box. And please don't try to unmute yourself or anything like that. Just type your question. And at the end of the lecture, I'll go ahead and read the questions aloud to Dr. Mahan. We might not have time for all of the questions, but we'll get to as many as we can during that time. So as uh, I said, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker. Dr. Charles Mahan graduated with a BA in chemistry and German at the Washington University of St. Louis in, tw in uh, 2008. Dr. Mahan then attended Northwestern University for graduate school where he studied organometallic and coordination chemistries of multidentate ligands under the guidance of Dr. Chad Mirkin. He obtained his PhD in inorganic chemistry in 2012, as well as the Gillowitz Award for Outstanding Senior Graduate Student. From 2013 to 2016, he was a postdoctoral researcher with Dr. Clifford Kubiak at the University of California, San Diego, where he studied electrocatalysis and spectroelectrochemical characterization methods. He is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Virginia. And here, Dr. Mahan has advanced the field of electrocatalysis, especially in regard to carbon dioxide reduction. So I'll get ahead and stop sharing and pass this on to you, Dr. Mahan, whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you very much, Laurieann and Corbin. It's such a pleasure to have been invited. Uh, a very generous introduction of me and what we've been trying to accomplish here at the University of Virginia. Uh, thank you to everybody who's joining today. I look forward to questions. Uh, as I told Laurieann and Corbin, it was interesting preparing this lecture because it's kind of a combination of a little bit more detail on the electrochemical methods we use and how it helps us understand catalysis. And so, while I won't be able to bring a, a, a huge amount of depth to some of the topics, I hope to touch on a, several of the techniques and the ways we analyze catalytic reactions. And hopefully that can impart some insight um, into related areas. And I look forward to the questions afterwards where hopefully I can add some additional detail. And so, uh, what I wanted to start off with is something I've been inspired to do by the efforts of the Department of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota and kind of the continuing work of Bill Tolman, who's now at, who moved from Minnesota to Washington University in St. Louis, and that is to begin each lecture by having a safety minute and a common lab reagent that actually has some pretty significant concerns that we should all be aware of is fuming nitric acid, right? And so fuming nitric acid is something over 70% concentrated nitric acid, uh, dilution of this reagent with water can produce a large amount of heat and corrosive flames. You need safety goggles to protect your eyes from splashing in fumes because safety glasses will not prevent vapors from coming into contact with the eye. Uh, lab coat obviously should always be worn. The unique hazard with concentrated nitric acid is that it actually will spontaneously ignite nitrile gloves, which are one of the common ways that we don hand protection in the lab. And so when handling this reagent, it's key that you actually switch from a nitrile-based protective glove to one that uses Viton or butyl rubber. And of course, general synthetic laboratory preparation should always be done with long pants and closed-toed shoes, in addition to the lab coat and the safety goggles. So, uh, with that little safety reminder about one of the common hazards that we could have in the lab, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're interested in catalytic chemistry and why we use electrochemistry. And so the big challenge is the remediation of atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And so this chart is compiled and updated uh, constantly from the Scripps Oceanographic Institute in San Diego. And what it is, is a measurement of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And you can see essentially since the invention of the internal combustion engine, 
We've been running an experiment on our cells in which we aerosolize large amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. And that atmospheric level is well over 400 parts per million, whereas in 1740 from merged ice core records, we can estimate it that it was about 280 parts per million. So it's a pretty significant change over a relatively short time frame. And the International Panel on Climate Change convened a special report at the end of 2017, which made a prediction about what the consequences of this are going to be. And so what we see here is a model that predicts three outcomes, one in which we change nothing, one in which we make a slight decay towards uh, net zero by 2055, and another in which we do a much faster curbing of CO2 emissions. And what you can see in all cases across these models is that it seems like even if we begin curbing CO2 emissions, our best case scenario is to still expect a limiting warming of one and a half degrees Celsius, which is gonna significantly move the extremes of our weather patterns and cause a large amount of disruption in terms of where population centers can be located in areas of the world which are more sensitive to the impacts of climate change. And so one way to address the production of CO2 is to look at alternative energy sources. And two examples of these we might consider are wind and solar. Of course, these have temporal and geographic limitations, whereas producing power through combustion might not. We need the wind to blow and we need the sun to be shining in order to collect either of these forms of energy. And so it might not always be convenient for us to do so. Peak electricity usage generally occurs at the end of the day, whereas peak collection for a form of renewable energy like solar tends to happen at noon. And so there's a significant time displacement of when we can collect electricity to when we can use it. And so there's a lot of research exploring different ways to offset this point of capture to point of use, uh, things like redox flow batteries. One method we're interested in, is using, in using is designating small molecules as energy carriers. That is, we're going to look at this problem as, well, we've got this highly oxidized form of carbon, carbon dioxide, Maybe if we can convert it using electrical energy, we can store that electrical energy in chemical bonds, use it when we need to, and also produce commodity chemicals or their precursors, which might otherwise be produced through ways that are just producing more carbon dioxide. And so ideally what we want to do is take the sun and use it to recycle CO2 through chemistry into the fuels, uh, precursors, and commodity chemicals that we might need. And this approach is generally inspired by the example that nature sets for us. On a scale of 10 to the 11th ton, 10 to the 11 tons per year, nature is fixing CO2. And, and that's generally how we have most forms of fixed carbon on the planet. And this is occurring at reasonably low efficiencies. Uh, there are some exceptions to this. Plants like sugarcane can do this with about 8% efficiency and grow quite rapidly. But What's really intriguing about this is we can conceptualize this large scale global problem, but it also has a very direct basic chemical question. And that is, if we're gonna designate chemical bonds as a useful storage point for electrical energy, how do we understand how electrons and protons move during the formation and cleavage of bonds and small molecules? And so this really comes down to a basic research question of is can we not only understand this movement, but use that understanding as a way to direct the flow of energy into or out of these small molecule carriers. And so from the beginning, what's useful to understand is the connection between what we might consider normal reaction chemistry, catalytic chemistry, and electrochemical energy. So there are two types of electrochemical cells. One of these is a galvanic cell. And this is like a battery you might have in your phone, or your car or any other device that uh, requires electricity but can't be plugged into a wall. And so what you'll notice here is that there's a unique relationship between the delta G of a reaction, the Gibbs free energy, and the standard potential of that reaction, E0. And so for a galvanic cell where we can spontaneously discharge electricity by running a chemical reaction, we've got a positive cell potential and therefore, because of the opposite sign relationship, a negative Gibbs free energy, which renders the process spontaneous. 
Now, of course, when we deplete batteries, uh, it's possible to recharge some batteries, which is to run the reaction in reverse. And this is an electrolytic cell. Here we have to apply a potential to move a reaction uphill and store energy. So the difference here is, in one sense, we're recovering electrical energy from uh, chemical compounds. In the other, we're storing electrical energy into chemical compounds. And so understanding how to run either of these reactions, generally with small molecules, is going to give us a lot of opportunities to design and optimize processes for catalytic conversions we might be specifically interested in. Now, CO2 is a challenging substrate, in part because it's a highly inert molecule. And what we see here are some calculations that were run by Frontenaise and coworkers. And what they were comparing was the difference in the energy of the molecule when it's linear, as it is in its normal state, to simply trying to bend it to an angle of 100 degrees. And what you can see here is that quite rapidly, the energy of the system increases as we begin bending that oxygen carbon oxygen angle and so why are we interested in this process of bending and this difference in energy well if we're talking about reductively functionalizing co2 we need to begin breaking these carbon oxygen bonds and that means doing what we can to destroy the high degree of symmetry and stability imparted by this highly symmetric pi orbital that connects both oxygen atoms through the carbon because as we bend this molecule, a distinct change happens to the shape of the molecular orbitals. The in-plane orbital begins to drop in energy, and that's our accessible point for reducing and converting CO2, whether we're directing a hydride here or we're trying to bind CO2 to a transition metal center. This is going to be the orbital that we're actually able to access with the proper degree of symmetry. And you can see that as we bend, these occupied lone pairs begin to push the system higher in energy as the symmetry overall is broken and they begin interacting with each other since they're no longer located on opposite sides of the molecule. And so because we generally approach this from a molecular transition metal complex perspective, we, we use synthetic chemistry to uh, tune the properties of our complexes. And what we're very interested in is beg, begging, borrowing, and stealing from this natural inspiration. So one of the ways nature runs highly reversible, energy-efficient reactions with CO2 is by using multiple unique motifs in the active sites of any of the metalloenzymes. And so here we've got CO dehydrogenase. You'll notice that there's a bimetallic activation of CO2. Nickel's binding carbon. Iron is stabilizing oxygen. But there are some other interesting features here. We see a histidine with a black line drawn to the oxygen, stabilizing that part of the molecule. And then a pendant lysine group here, this K, with the other oxygen. And so it's clear that these active sites use tricks to lower relative barriers and resolve energetic positioning between intermediates in such a way that the potential energy surface of an overall reaction starts to get really flat. And that's how you run it with low energy input and that's how you run it uh, with high degrees of activity. And so our research efforts in the lab spread across electrocatalytic oxygen conversion, CO2 conversion, and then trying to scale these molecular processes in scalable systems. Today I'm gonna to focus on CO2 because a lot of our results give really nice insights into the basics of the techniques and how we can evaluate catalytic responses. So let's start with talking about one of the core concepts of any electrocatalytic process, and that is that there is an electron transfer taking place. So we may be familiar with homogeneous electron transfer between two solubilized reactants. One loses an electron, one gains an electron. Now, while molecules contort and move vibrationally and interact with solvent, and this changes their energy levels slightly, overall, the reducing and oxidizing power remains relatively fixed. What's unique about an electrochemical system wherein you're using an electrode is the electron transfer becomes heterogeneous. And one of the unique features of electrochemistry is that a potentiostat, which is what we use to drive these reactions, allows us to arbitrarily set the levels of the electrode 
with respect to what the homogeneous species in solution is. That is, if we need to oxidize something, we can simply apply a large enough positive potential that the electron will transfer from the substrate in solution to the electrode. And if we need to reduce it, we can do the opposite. And so I wanted to highlight here real briefly an excellent paper that was written by Jillian Dempsey and coworkers at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill that appeared in the Journal of Chemical Education in 2018. This is a great resource for people trying to understand the basics of homogeneous electrochemistry. And it's a good entry point to understanding a little bit more the, the concepts that we're gonna be talking about during this presentation. And so what we've been working on are molecular transition metal complexes using this bipyridine-based ligand framework. We like this because it, while it has a lot of similarities with the more classic saline motif, it's intrinsically much more stable because of this extended aromatic backbone, which protects these potentially reactive imine bonds as part of this tetradentate chelate. Now, what's interesting about this system is there's a high degree of electron richness in these phenols. And when deprotonated as phenolates, they actually become extremely sensitive to the concentration of and activity of proton donors in solution. And this uh, adds a lot of kinetic and thermodynamic complexity to the systems we study, but it also allows us to employ a lot of techniques that can give us a lot of information about the system. And so one example of this is that the iron three to two reduction is sensitive to proton donors in solution. And using electrochemistry, we can measure an equilibrium association constant for the proton transfer to this iron compound that remains independent of whether or not argon is present. And what's unique here is that the system is beginning to pull in proton equivalents and proton donors as it acquires more electrons, both as a way to uh, achieve charge balance as it becomes more reduced. But what this means is it's possible to shift and move the system with respect to standard reaction potentials if we start designing the complex in certain ways and selecting specific types of proton domes. So the obvious question is how do we arrive at these equilibrium association values, right? Well, the first thing we're gonna to have to do is conduct a cyclic voltammetry experiment. And the basic shape we see in a CV for a homogeneous species is this one shown in tab H here at the lower left. So during a CV experiment, we might start at point A. At point A in solution, what we have are almost 100% of ferrocinium ions in solution and none of the reduced version of ferrocene. And so what we're going to do is sweep from positive potentials to negative potentials. And in doing so, we're going to hit the potential at which ferrocinium reduction occurs by one electron to produce ferrocene. Now, this is an idealized redox couple, and it's often used as an analytical standard because it is so well behaved. We're going from a 17 electron cationic iron species to a neutral 18 electron species. So as we begin sweeping this potential, we start approaching this purple line, which is the thermodynamic potential of ferrocene reduction. But we can see that reduction actually starts before we hit that potential. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. But what's happening here as we approach point B, which is this standard potential, is that the solution at the electrode interface now contains 50% of ferrocene and 50% of ferrocinium. And so at that potential where we're equilibrated between the two possible end states of that electron transfer reaction, that's the standard or thermodynamic potential of the reaction. Now because the bulk concentration doesn't reflect this and we actually see that there's a gradient that's being established based on how fast we're scanning, it means that the current response will actually go on to peak after this standard point as we begin consuming everything within a diffusion layer away from the electra. So we have to remember that for molecular homogeneous species, these have to diffuse to the electrode to either collect or deposit an electron as part of an overall electrochemical reaction. And by the time we reach point D in our current sweep over our voltage sweep over a fixed amount of time, we see that at the electrode surface, we're at near 100% of the reduced species and zero of the ferrocinium species. 
But what we'll notice here is that D actually has a larger amount of current than A. Why is that? That's because from our bulk solution, there is some defined rate of diffusion of these species into the area where electron transfer can occur. When we swept from A to D, we actually consumed a bulk concentration that wasn't representative of how fast it could get to the electrode. And that's why there's a peak in current that's much larger than when we're relying purely on the molecular process to get us to the electrode. And so CVs or cyclic voltammetry were cycling from one potential to another and then back again over a fixed amount of time. So once we hit D, we're going to cycle back towards A. And what happens is we see a ripple in the relative concentrations of this diffusion layer. And generally, as we go backwards to point E, we again see that we get this 50-50 mixture at the electrode bulk solution interface. We can go to this peak again, where we've got this concentration that's not representative of the diffusion rate to the electrode until we hit point G. Now notice here that point G does not represent a complete overlap with A. That's because the solution has this memory of what we just did to it in the fact that in the diffusion layer where we're affecting this diffusion of bulk concentrations of our ferrocinium and ferrocene to the electrode, we put in this ripple by sweeping across to a reducing voltage over an amount of time that went faster than the system can re-equilibrate. And that means that there's some background amount of current here. Now, an important thing to also remember is that there's capacitive current in most electrochemical systems, and this can also cause a separation. But you can also note here that the system does respond to what you've done to it within certain time windows. And understanding the effect those time windows can have on electrochemical and electrocatalytic processes is actually key to extracting a lot of information. So when we studied this iron system, what we did was titrate in a proton donor, in this case phenol, under otherwise identical conditions and monitor the change in the observed potential based on this. So for any electrochemical reaction, we might have some standard potential E0. The potential we actually observe in solution is going to be dependent on the reaction equilibrium involved. Now, if this is a redox couple that doesn't respond to proton donor, nothing's going to change. But if the reduction product is responsive to the presence of a proton donor, that reaction equilibrium and the relative amounts of the proton donor and its conjugate base are going to shift the potential we actually observe in solution. And so if we deliberately modify concentrations in solution of all of these components, we can begin extracting this kind of information on the equilibrium association constants, right? And so here we've got a, a nice image showing the difference between a system where the equilibrium is zero, K equals zero, here's our D. And so the process that's being depicted here is there's a reduced species, which is oxidized by some number of electrons, and that oxidized species is in some equilibrium to produce a product P, okay? And so we can see that as that equilibrium constant for this second step increases to 100, the redox wave shifts towards more and more negative potentials. So what that equilibrium constant is reporting on is the ratio of product P over the oxidized species O. Now, why should this shift the potential of the reaction? Well, in basic terms, how you should consider this is as soon as any of this reduced species gets oxidized, it's rapidly establishing an equilibrium. And so what that's going to do is accelerate that reduction process as this is consumed according to the second relationship as soon as it begins happening. And the reason this causes a shift to more positive potentials is one of the tricks of what actually happens in electrochemistry. And so what's shown here is a famous equation in electrochemistry, which is the Butler-Volmer equation. Now what's important about this is there are three curves shown on the plot. The green curve is the cathodic current only. That's happening at the reducing potentials in this relative cell. 
The red curve is the anodic current. That's what's happening in terms of the anodic process. And the black curve actually summarizes the two of them. And so if we think about any potential, for instance, if we go to the standard potential of a reaction, remember we're at equal concentrations of reduced and oxidized species. This also means that it's just as easy to do the forward reaction, the reduction, as it is to do the reverse reaction, the oxidation. So although we might see zero current in our current over potential curves, this is actually reflecting the fact that there are equal amounts of reducing and oxidizing current at that potential. And what you can also see is that even though we're at potentials which are more positive here in the green curve than the actual quote unquote thermodynamic potential, you start reducing some of those species in solution. And while that might be a relatively minor concentration of the bulk, if that's being affected by a following reaction, like this equilibrium reaction we've been discussing, what that means is the system is driven to more positive potentials. Now, I can't do the Butler-Volmer equation or the nuances of this K equilibrium a great deal of justice given the time constraints, but what I can do is uh, direct you to several textbooks that are quite useful for parsing some of the nuances and the greater detail of the theory behind these electrochemical processes. And so there's a, a Saviat and Kostantan, uh, Elements of Molecular and Biomolecular, the uh, Barden Faulkner book, Electrochemical Methods, and then one of my uh, favorites is Inorganic Electrochemistry by Piero Zanello and uh, others in the second, second edition, Carlo Nervi. Um, so uh, with that, Unfortunately, the catalytic properties of that iron complex were relatively limited in terms of their selectivity. It only produced formate with about 70% selectivity. And of course, for any catalytic process, you want to be efficient for a single substrate. What we discovered is that there was a competing process in which carbon monoxide was produced, whether or not uh, a proton donor was present, and that the iron species didn't release this CO that was produced, which meant that the catalyst system was polluted over time. And we were able to determine this because we used something called infrared spectroelectrochemistry. Now, spectroelectrochemistry is a general term in which we're going to couple a spectroscopic technique with our electrochemical cell. And what this means is we can turn CV waveforms into kind of an understanding of speciation. And so the, the design we use here is a reflectance mode, wherein we've got a reflectance accessory where the IR source is directed off a mirror through a IR transparent calcium fluoride window. There's a PTFE cutout with a void space into which we inject volume. And on top is our three electrodes setup, which is shown here. So these holes on either side is how we can in inject solution into here using needles under air-free conditions. And this outer dark colored ring is the counter electrode. That silvery ring in the middle is our reference electrode. And this dark colored uh, disc in the center is our working electrode. And so the IR source directs off of the working electrode, similar to the position of my pointer here on the screen. And what that does is allow us to turn these CV waveforms into spectroscopic information. And so at some potential, we might see one species in solution here, this green uh, spectrum in the upper left. As we approach and go past this potential where there is a redox response, we might see a new spectrum emerge. And we can use this in addition to our CV techniques to understand how our catalysts are behaving or degrading in solution under catalytic conditions. Inspired by this understanding, we thought, well, okay, if there is something to this interaction of proton donors with the metal bound heteroatom, what if we started replacing these largely uh, afunctional tert-butyl groups with something that could direct the flow of proton donors towards the metal site. And then we'd have a metal ligand construct in which we had a way to not only bring proton donors in, but potentially stabilize substrate bound to the active site. 
tuning the activity and selectivity of the system, right? And again, drawing that inspiration I talked about for the pendant functional groups in the secondary coordination sphere of CO dehydrogenase. And so to study this, what we selected initially was a catechol-based system in which we positioned a Bronsted acid in the secondary coordination sphere and a creosol-based system in which we put a Lewis basic group. And the idea was to see which of these would actually allow us to pre-concentrate the sacrificial proton donor and enhance the electrocatalytic response. And so here are the structures as determined by uh, single crystal X-ray crystallographic methods. What's interesting here is that with the decreased steric bulk of the tert butyl groups, you can see that these actually want to aggregate in the solid state. Now using RRD, RDE methods, rotating disk electrode methods, we actually established that these were monomers in solution. But what's interesting here is in the catechol system, a partial deprotonation of one of those pendant OH groups has occurred. And charge is actually balanced by the complete exclusion of chloride, which we could verify happened in the bulk using microanalysis methods. But what we had here were our two complexes that would behave in solution as monomers. And so the next step was to test their electrocatalytic properties. And what was interesting is they both had the same catalyst operating potential, which is a concept we'll talk about here in a moment. But the difference between the two is that one produced nearly three times the amount of catalytic current density for formate. Not only that, it did so with a much higher Faradaic efficiency. And while it wasn't the one we initially expected, the creosol derivative turns out to be interesting for several reasons, right? But here on this slide, we've shown some, the results of some analysis of the molecular, molecular electrocatalytic properties. It's gonna be helpful to talk about the terms and kind of how we got there. And so if we're going to observe and identify a catalytic response, what we're generally hoping for is a shift in the system from the black trace shown here to the red current trace shown here only when substrate is present. And so this is representative data from a catalyst that produces dihydrogen from proton donors. But you can see that this large irreversible waveform occurs when the proton is present as substrate that doesn't exist in the absence of added proton donor. Now catalysts are evaluated by several methods. So one thing that's important to determine is how fast the system is operating. And this again is one of the unique features of electrochemistry is that while we have a thermodynamic readout in terms of voltage, current is telling us kinetic information. And so if we can accurately understand the difference between the current under catalytic conditions and the current under non-catalytic conditions, we can begin assigning rates of turnover frequency, et cetera, for how the catalyst is actually behaving. Another feature is overpotential. Overpotential is the amount of electrochemical driving force you have to apply to a system to drive a chemical reaction that's beyond what it should require in terms of the thermodynamic minimum. And so for this, we generally use terms like the E cat by two, which is the voltage at half peak catalytic current height. And this is a way to bookmark the absolute operating parameters of the catalytic response with respect to the thermodynamic potential. Now there are two equations here shown in the lower left which describe Faradaic current and catalytic current. Faradaic current is the current we see here in black. It's the electrochemical response of a homogeneous system that just accepts an electron. It's defined by a number of standard parameters, including the number of electrons transferred, Faraday's constant, the area of the electrode, how much of the substrate you have in solution, as well as the scan rate, how fast you're cycling, and the diffusion constant. A catalytic current response has many of the same dependencies. However, what's dictating the amount of current we're seeing is proportional in part to the observed catalytic rate constant, right? And so a common feature of doing analysis of electrochemical systems is that it's relatively difficult to deal with things in terms of the absolutes of all the reaction parameters. And so a convenient trick is to normalize the system, often to itself, so that you can make it an arbitrary descriptor of the catalytic properties. 
And what I mean by that in this case simply is that we're going to take that catalytic current expression and divide it by the Faradaic one. This normalizes the area of the electrode and all of the other reaction parameters outside of a couple things that we can actually tune experimentally, allowing us to derive the observed catalytic rate constant. Now, a cautionary tale here is that this really only accurately describes systems that look like this in red. This is an S-shaped catalytic response. When your catalytic response doesn't look like this, there are actually a, a number of other things that could be a potential limiting factor, which we're gonna talk about now. So not all molecular catalytic waves achieve this ideal S-shaped feature, right? In fact, for an electrocatalytic process in which an electron transfer precedes a multi-electron uh, catalytic step C prime, the waveform can have a number of different shapes. And so the figure here shown on the left is what's known as a kinetic zone diagram. And what this is summarizing is how the relative balance of factors which dictate the chemical parameters of the system impact the waveform you see when you run an experiment. And so the generic reaction we're talking about here is one in which some molecule P is reduced by an electron to Q. This is our activated catalyst, Q. Q converts A to a product B with some rate K, regenerating P again at the beginning. So how do we get these different types of waveforms? Well, one controlling parameter is the kinetic parameter, lambda. And we'll see that our system has been normalized here, and the only real descriptors are our scan rate, the amount of catalyst in solution, and the catalytic rate constant. And that's what's shown on our y-axis. So as we go up, Ke is increasing. As we go down the y-axis, scan rate is increasing. And we'll talk about why scan rate is opposite to the catalytic rate constant. But what this is telling us is if we do something like change the scan rate for a catalytic response and see a change in waveform, we can understand where we're moving across in terms of the catalytic system through these different boundary conditions. The other controlling parameter is the ratio of substrate to catalyst, which is also known as the excess factor, gamma. And so what's going to dictate the amount of catalytic current is going to be, is there enough substrate to supply the catalyst when it's activated? So in this S-shaped voltammogram here, what's controlling the system is the rate of catalytic response. There's more substrate available to the system than it needs. And so the, the waveform is perfectly symmetric out to the catalytic potential and back again. Most catalysts tend to fall in this upper right regime here where we get this very irreversible wave, but it doesn't exactly overlay. And this happens because the balance of bulk diffusion to the electrode does not match the catalytic rate very well. There are other specialized cases as we shift along the various ratios of gamma and lambda. To understand these with a little bit more detail, I encourage you to consult uh, both those textbooks that I mentioned previously, but also this great summary, which was also done by Jillian Dempsey at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So since we can control how much, what, what region of the zone diagram we're in by changing the scan rate, if we go through orders of magnitude with how fast we're sweeping through potentials, we can get to regimes where the waveform takes on certain shapes. And you can see here that we might get that very irreversible EC prime response at relatively modest scan rates. But as we go up to 100 volts a second, a 10 to the three increase, we can see that the catalytic waveform takes on that S shape that gives us so much information about the catalytic system. And so a couple of things to note here. We see at higher scan rates that there's more current. This is because we're experiencing greater flux at the electrodes, at the electrode, the working electrode. One of the very tricky things about electrochemistry is that what's actually happening here is we're sampling less of the solution during our experiment because we're scanning so fast, but flux is greater. 
And flux is greater because the reaction diffusion layer shrinks as we increase scan rate. And while this may seem counterintuitive, I'm gonna belabor this for a second to hopefully make it clear. So when I say flux, I'm talking about the current we see at an electrode, which is proportional to the area and diffusion coefficient and the concentration profile of whatever we're reducing or oxidizing. If we have more of it by the electrode, we should have more current, right? And so if we're using ferrous cyanides reduction as an example reaction, we need ferrous cyanide to diffuse to the electrode, accept an electron and diffuse away. The relative concentration of this substrate and how close it is to the electrode is that concentration profile. It's determined by the diffusion coefficient of that molecule, and it's gonna tell us that current readout. So what happens when you change how quickly you sweep through the solution? Well, as we sweep faster and faster, we push the diffusion layer closer and closer to the electrode. T1 is our 100 volts per second time scale here. And the reason flux is greater is because the bulk concentration conditions are much closer to the working electrode. Whereas when we scan very slowly, we begin consuming everything in solution, that bulk concentration conditions are pushed much further away from the electrode. And so when we scan quickly, we experience greater flux, even though we're sampling less of the solution. And there's a great resource here on the UC Davis Chem Wiki that kind of goes into further detail about this. But I think these figures are exceptional at illustrating this point and this kind of counterintuitive notion that faster scan rates and larger current is reflecting the sampling of less material immediately in solution. So, um, one additional factor we had to understand and accurately model for this iron-based system was the idea that these pendant relays were impacting the catalytic rate. Specifically, what we thought was happening is that, ooh, what we thought was happening was that a uh, proton donor was being pre-concentrated by the reduced catalyst, and that was facilitating proton transfer to do things like make the metal hydride we needed to get net CO2 insertion. Now, pendant relay effects are often non-trivial to accurately diagnose. You need a lot of comparison compounds, and you need to know the bounds of your system very well. And that's because the current response you see has a lot of new components. This is overall the same generic EC prime type mechanism we talked about, but you can see that there are a lot of new factors. What we have here in this equation is the protonation of our pendant relay, uh, when the compound is in its oxidized form, and the protonation of the pendant relay when it's in its reduced form. Both of these reactions are overall going to contribute to the current response we see, and any boosting of the catalytic response when we've got substrate present, and the relay has been protonated. And what's interesting about this is, what it's telling is you is that you have to match proton activity to your relay, both the association of proton donor to that relay, but also the relay transfer to the active site. If those reactions, those equilibrium reactions aren't balanced, all of a sudden you're not gonna have an efficient relay effect. And even if you do balance those very well, for most relays, the boosting effect is gonna be a relatively minor component of the catalysis you see. So in Figure B here on the right, what we see is the current response we observe. The two different lines plotted are the catalytic response of proton donor diffusing, or substrate in this case, diffusing to the active site. And then this smaller feature here at the bottom is what the relay contributes. As we get the catalytic rate at the metal center to be faster and faster, the ability of that boosting effect from the pendant relay to keep up begins to diminish as it takes more time to refill from the bulk solution, which means that the dominant contribute to the cat, contributor to the catalytic response ends up being the diffusion of substrate directly to the metal center. And again, this is a, a recent publication by Saviant, which offers a lot more detail about that relay effect. I wanted to end by talking about a, a kind of a combination of things we can do if we've got a well-behaved catalytic system. In this case, a chromium-based electrocatalyst developed by our lab that had this highly diagnostic 
S-shaped current response. And because we have this, we can do a lot of kinetic analysis and actually CV simulation to extract reaction parameters. What's unique about this system is that, to the best of our knowledge, there is no other homogeneous chromium-based molecular electrocatalyst for this reaction. It has exceptional efficiencies and stabilities and operates with relatively low electrochemical driving force relative to what's required to drive the reaction. What's also interesting is that, although there are several reduction features here, through careful experimentation, we were able to determine that this actually arises from only an overall two electron total reduction of the chromium, and that these multiple waves at the beginning are the result of a chloride loss equilibrium from our precatalyst, which we can perturb by adding a solubilized chloride source. The waves condense and move to more reducing potentials because we've upset this equilibrium and we're favoring this neutral species in solution rather than this cationic one. Because we have this nice kinetically limited waveform, we can vary all of our substrate components and analyze the catalytic current in terms of catalyst concentration and substrate concentration to establish reaction orders for the system and see that we have a relatively well-behaved system that's first order in phenol, catalyst, and CO2 concentrations. Next, what we can do is use this information to design a proposed electrocatalytic mechanism and simulate the CV response using digital simulation software, in this case, uh, a DigiElch version 8. And what this allows us to do is compare with our experimental values shown in green, but also fill in a lot of the values we weren't sure about from uh, the electrochemical methods. And we can see that CO2 binding is favorable and that the rate determining step is COH bond cleavage. And as a result of this experimentation, we've actually got a lot of ways that we can think about tweaking the system synthetically to optimize this catalytic response. A note on standard potentials here as I finish up uh, the lecture content. Um, we're comfortable with pH for aqueous systems, right? We've got an acid, the acid has some acid dissociation equilibrium, the extent of that equilibrium establishes a pH in an aqueous system, right? And through a variety of ways, we're very comfortable with describing both what a solubilized proton looks like, the H3O plus complex, and how it transfers in between water molecules. For water, this is relatively well defined. We have a very good thermodynamic and conceptual understanding of what this means. Something that we've done less of a good job with is understanding the differences in non-aqueous systems. And in non-aqueous systems, we don't solubilize charge as well as we do in water, which means that reactions like a homoconjugation equilibrium between the conjugate base of an acid and the acid become significant. And so the proton donor I've been talking about here, phenol, has quite significant equilibrium, homoconjugation equilibrium constants in both DMF and acetonitrile, which are our common electrochemical solvents. This means that our reaction parameters, anything we measure, is actually being affected by quite a significant driving force that will add on the order of five to six kcals per mole to the driving force of a reaction. And there are a couple ways to get around this. You can carefully titrate in ratios of your acid and your conjugate base to establish how the redox response shifts. This is example data shown from our manganese catalyst that produces hydrogen peroxide from oxygen, a different type of reduction chemistry. But we can see here that the slope is telling us that it's one proton per electron because we're close to the magic number of 59 millivolts per decade of that ratio. Uh, another trick to get around the complexities of the homoconjugation equilibrium are to use very low concentrations of added acid. If your concentration of added acid is much less than this ratio here on the right, you can use that to analyze the system as a potential pKa diagram. And this is a non-aqueous uh, pseudo analog of a Porbe diagram. It's giving us information on the redox response and its responsiveness to changes in the acid donor pKa. Uh, again, here we're indebted to Jillian Dempsey, who pioneered this method and has a nice summary of it shown here in this reference at the bottom. 
And so with that, I'd like to thank all my students. I'd like to thank uh, Lorianne and Corbin again for the invitation. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. And I'm happy to discuss any aspects of this in our remaining time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahan, for that really amazing lecture with really thorough background. That was great. We have um, a couple questions for you. Firstly, you mentioned catalysts that had uh, iron, chromium, and manganese center. Which of these is best, and how do you, what type of metal do you look for when you're looking for electrocatalysts? So I, uh, I didn't say this in the intro, but um, from a sustainability perspective, we're trying to push the envelope by selecting things that are more earth abundant. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, from the earth abundancy perspective, um, the clear winner is always going to be iron. But even using things like chromium and manganese, they're not that far behind. And we have the benefit of chromium and manganese are often byproducts of the production of other chemicals that are uh, metal centers that we need in high abundance and uh, steel for chromium in particular. And so um, I think from a kind of a basic science perspective, the chromium is the most interesting. Um, one of the great things about iron is its abundance and it can do almost any catalytic reaction. It's really a fantastic metal center. And so um, anything that gets you high activity and selectivity without having to spend a lot of electrical energy is good. And we're hopeful that we can push the chromium system to compete with iron. Awesome, thank you. For your dh bipy catalyst or any multi-dentate catalyst for that matter, how are you able to tune its selectivity uh, using the substituent groups? Uh, well, so one example would be um, tuning how electron donating or electron withdrawing it is. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the catalytic cycle here for chromium, as I, I mentioned kind of on the race towards the end here was that it's this step here that becomes rate determining and cleaving the COH bond becomes tricky. So if we think about this from a molecular orbital perspective, what we want to do is give chromium sufficient reducing power in order to make cleavage of this bond facile. And if we use electron withdrawing groups, we're pulling electron density away from the chromium center and that would slow the reaction down by creating a much higher barrier. And so to accelerate this, what we might want to explore is making the complex more electron rich. An alternative is uh, the pendant strategy I showed. In this case, we were able to enhance selectivity and activity through a largely kinetic effect. There was a minimal difference in the thermodynamic operating potential of these two compounds, but by having a system which could accumulate the proton donors here, the creosol, but not form these types of uh, irreversible interactions or relatively irreversible interactions. We could dial the system in for greater activity and selectivity, even though it had a minimum intrinsic preference between making uh, formate and CO. Awesome. Um, a similar question is you mentioned changing that this one substituent group to the uh, alcohol as shown here. Have you tried changing the other terbutyl group and seen any impact on the rates for that? We have uh, relatively few results on that. It's something we're interested in. It's a very good question. Um, from a simple organic chemistry perspective, obviously, uh, meta and pair groups can engender similar effects on a specific position of a ring. And so understanding how much of a relative effect each of those has is something that's gonna be interesting for us to examine in more detail as we go on. Awesome. Have you experienced any troubles with evaporation of your solvent when you were doing spectroelectrochemical in your spectroelectrochemical cell? So the spectroelectrochemical cell is a sealed system. We use PTFE tubing and we seal it with um, surgical calipers after we inject in our, uh, our analyte in the solution of interest. So evaporation considerations are, are really not a problem. What can be complicating there is if uh, a large amount of gas bubbles are created or if the cell isn't sealed tightly and, it, and the solution leaks out. Um, 
But, you know, if it's assembled correctly, considerations from evaporation are relatively minimal because it's a closed system. That makes sense. Um, could you comment on how you determine the localization of the electron in the complex for these tetracoordinated ligands besides using DFT? Um, so besides DFT, we haven't done anything. Uh, something we're interested in doing and have proposals for is uh, the use of synchrotron-based methods against analytical standards in specific oxidation states. Um, oxidation states are difficult to assign completely. What I can say generally is that although we talk about formal changes in metal oxidation state, these really are molecular orbitals and the the BIPI core of the ligand is very much involved in any of the added electron density. Um, and we can see that experimentally that this is so low lying because these are actually um, really highly colored compounds by UV biz. Uh, and from our DFT studies, what the TD DFT says is that it's largely ligand to metal charge transfer between the electron rich phenols and the iron center, which is mixing with the BIPI. Awesome. Um, one last question. When you were discussing uh, CV at the start, you mentioned that your last step, G, did not overlap with your first step due to capacitive cur current. Could you please explain what uh, capacitive current is? Capacitive current is a charging effect. Uh, and so in the double layer, it's not just our product and our starting compound. There are solvent molecules and there are positively and negatively charged components, which are our electrolyte. And so in water, this might be lithium and chloride. When you start biasing the electrode, that inner diffusion layer has to reorient in order according to the charge of the electrode to kind of screen it from the bulk solution. And so it, it, it starts to involve a lot of concepts that we are familiar with from things like physical organic chemistry. This idea that there's a, there's a uh, kind of an order that's developing in the solvent and there's a restructuring effect and some uh, consequences in terms of kind of background current that we will see from that. And so what you need to make sure to minimize the capacitive current is that you have a sufficient concentration of uh, electrolyte, which is these uh, cations and anions to kind of make sure charge transfer and solution is relatively good. And that your electrochemical cell is positioned such that there's not a lot of uh, separation in between your three electrodes for an analytical CV setup. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I have one concluding slide then. So thank you so, so much again, Dr. Mahan, for all your time and giving this excellent lecture. We all really appreciate it.